Dem is de termen. Dem is de balken ende. Dem is de Asselborn Excellencies. Uh, dear members of uh, the Benelux Parliament, President and the Vice President, President of the Court, the Benelux Court, dear students, not only from the three Benelux countries, but also from our partner, uh, North Rhine Westphalia, we are very happy that uh, you all are here. And there are other attendees in all your titles and capacities. And it's uh, our greatest pleasure on behalf of uh, my colleagues of the College of uh, the General Secretariat of the Benelux and myself, and honor to welcome you today in this beautiful location that's the Egmont Palace to celebrate together the 80th anniversary of the Benelux cooperation and the first official Benelux Day, which will be held as of today, each year on the 5th of September. When it first uh, created in uh, 1944, the Benelux had, had been designed as a customs union. It operated as such until uh, 1958, when its portfolio was widened to various economic matters and not just customs thereby being renamed as the Benelux Economic Union. And so the Benelux countries worked hand in hand for 50 years. And one of the reasons uh, why we are gathered here today is because nearing the end of those 50 years, a decision had to be made about the future of the Benelux cooperation. A decision to pursue its activities, perhaps even broadening its fields of study. And in the face of uh, uh, the political and geopolitical context of that time, perhaps also foreseeing the potential and advantage of the Benelux cooperation could possess amidst an ever-widening European Union, our three countries took that step. And we are very glad and honored that uh, uh, former uh, prime ministers and ministers of foreign affairs, uh, again among three, uh, uh, three of our distinguished guests, made that decision back in time, uh, which I thank again for being here with us today. They signed in 2008 the treaty revising uh, the 1958 treaty thereby significantly expanding our mandate to matters such as security, sustainability, and internal market. And successfully so. And since then, the Benelux Union accomplished many cross-border projects, sometimes going as far as being a pioneer in its field, such as the Automatic uh, Diploma Recognition uh, Treaty, and from which the youth present here today uh, may hopefully benefit greatly. But as the Secretary General of the Benelux Union, I may be a little bit biased. Let me conclude by reminding you all uh, about the purpose of the symposium, as we like to call it, which is first and foremost to reflect on the history, the role and accomplishments of the Benelux Union but also to engage in a dialogue with the younger generation and learn about their, about their thoughts and worries. Because you are never too old to learn, even uh, at the advanced age of 80. And without any further ado, I'll give the word to our guest and moderator, Lisbeth, Lisbeth Inbo. Um, Many of you may already know Ms. Imbo, who had been, uh, has had a long and successful career as a journalist uh, and television host for established news channels such as uh, VRT News, where she co-hosted The Zevende Dag, uh, famous uh, for everybody who is interested in politics, uh, and The Morgen and she held the position of uh, Editor-in-Chief. So, Ms. Imbo, thank you for being here with us uh, today, and the floor is yours.
Thank you very much for that uh, nice welcoming word and a very afternoon, a very esteemed audience. And it's also for me a great honor to be here with you to celebrate the union of our countries on the first official Benelux Day after 80 years of collaboration. However, in all modesty, I must confess something to you. Of course, I knew that the Benelux countries existed and that they worked together. But to be honest, how, why, to what extent, as a journalist and also as a citizen, I couldn't bother. Flanders, yes. Belgium, of course. Europe, the European Union, yes. But this cooperation, I have to admit, it wasn't really on my radar. But therefore, we have a small corporate video, not only to enlighten me, but maybe also some of you, on what the Benelux Union does nowadays. Imagine a world without collaboration. Society has advanced through humans working together, transcending borders. At the forefront of all this was the Benelux Union. The Benelux Union had its origins in 1944 and is a cross-border collaboration between Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, aiming to improve the well-being of its citizens and industry. It serves as a testing ground and inspiration for the EU and played a key role in the Schengen Agreement, which enabled passport-free travel and seamless movement within 27 European countries. The Benelux Union has three main areas of focus, sustainability, market and economy, and security. Under our sustainability pillar, we work on things like climate adaptation, air quality, encouraging and facilitating bike usage, and the transition to renewable energy. Under our market and economy pillar, we work on things like protecting brands and intellectual property, taking away obstacles for cross-border retail, digital consignment notes, and informing frontier workers. And under our security pillar, we work on things like cross-border crisis management, police collaboration, food safety, healthcare, and road inspections. But our ambitions don't stop at the borders of the Benelux. In 2021, we created automatic recognition of qualifications in higher education between the Benelux and Baltic countries, making it easier for students and workers to study and work abroad. And more countries have already been inspired to join. We aim to continue to lead by example and collaborate in order to make life better, easier and safer. For them. Toen ik uh, verhuizen van België naar Nederland was eigenlijk best makkelijk om alle juiste papieren te krijgen voor een nieuw arbeidscontract uh, en dus aan mijn nieuwe baan te starten. Met de Benelux Commissie lopen we altijd een paar jaartjes voor op de Europese Commissie en dat geeft veel voordelen. La coopération aide à améliorer notre travail. And for you, now and in the future. Because the only way to create a symphony is by working together. all on the same page and we all know why we're here for today. In a moment we will hear from our esteemed uh, panelists why they were when they were back in office and still are interested in this union, how they see the future of this corporation and of course what the challenges will be for the next decade. And afterwards they will happily uh, engage with you in a conversation so if you have things you want to remark on, questions you have, you just keep them with you and afterwards you can take the floor, we have a microphone, so we'll manage to get your questions across. That's at the end of three small, but also interesting, humoristic, inspiring speeches by our statesmen. I will introduce them to you here in a second. But first, I would like to give the floor to someone who couldn't be here today, but was also very important at the time when the union was opened up with the treaty. And that's, of course, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, at the time Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Luxembourg for many years, but also we also know him as a former president of the European Council. 
And he was in office at Baghdad when they made that big decision and they signed the treaty in 2018, forced this union to make it more than an economic collaboration, but also a true union. He couldn't be here today, this afternoon, but with today's technology, that's no longer a problem to give him the floor. We have a little video. J'aurais été ravi d'être parmi vous ce soir. Mais une raison impérieuse m'empêche d'être des vôtres. J'aurais aimé, et je regrette sincèrement de ne pas y être, revoir mes collègues et amis Yves Le Terme et Jan Peter Balkin, and, avec lesquels j'ai vécu des moments euh, bénédictiens, à vrai dire inoubliables, notamment les sommets entre les trois premiers ministres la veille des conseils européens de l'Union européenne. Le Benelux, en fait, est un, un enfant de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, créé par les trois gouvernements euh, en exil, il y a 80 ans, à Londres, et reproduit sans hésiter après la, de, après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. L'enfant depuis est devenu adulte et depuis de longues années, il fait partie du paysage européen, gardant son identité propre qui est celle d'avoir préfiguré l'intégration européenne et l'Union européenne. Son identité et son savoir-faire ont toujours été respectés par les autres pays membres de l'Union européenne dont le traité sur l'Union européenne le reconnaît explicitement. Nous avons relancé le Benelux à plusieurs fois. La dernière initiative de relance remontant à l'année 2008, traité de la haie. Le Benelux s'est développé depuis et impressionne les autres pays membres par sa cohésion et sa fidélité à l'intégration européenne et les quelques divergences de vues momentanées ont été vite dépassées. Vive le Benelux et l'amitié entre les trois pays qui le composent. Voilà, still alive and kicking, Jean-Paul Juncker, Jean-Claude Juncker. And now it's time to give the floor to our guests who are actually present here with us. And it's a great honor to have those key players amongst us. It was already mentioned, eh? Mr. Yves Le Terme, Mr. Jan-Peter Balken, and, uh, and Mr. Jean Asselborn, who were in office when the question was asked, what is the future of this union? Is it still necessary to have one if we have something bigger, like the European Union? And what's the added value? If so, they decided to take the plunge and extend their cooperation from a purely economic one to a broader genuine union. It was already said also in the video with a focus on sustainability, on health issues, on security and things like that. So more like an actual union between three partners. But to what extent today is it still relevant all those years past? It's time to find out. So please welcome Yves Le Terme, Jan-Peter Balkenende and Jean Asselborn to the stage. <laughs> and as I said, I will first give you all a small uh, speech and the first speaker will be Yves Le Terme. Uh, he was Christian Democratic Prime Minister who co-signed this renewed cooperation in The Hague in 2008 and his view on then and now. Yves Le Terme. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Imbo, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, especially also the younger generations. Let me first, Mrs. Imbo, uh, correct you for once. Uh, me as a politician or former office holder, political office holder, towards a journalist. But to the uh, joy of Jean Asselborn, you quoted uh, Luxembourg as a kingdom. Now, uh, this is offending Jean-Claude Juncker because I remember Jan Peter that when uh, Jean-Claude Juncker was addressing his colleagues or took the floor, important meetings, I remember, for instance, the NATO summit in Bucharest that Jean-Claude used to say, well, before 
Madam Chair or Mrs. Chair, before giving the floor to the mid-size and small countries, I will first address the audience as a representative of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I correct Madam Imbo. Uh, Luxembourg is, uh, is not a kingdom. Uh, it's not a kingdom, but it's a Grand Duchy. Very pleased to be here. Um, of course, I have to be fair and honest, it is with mixed feelings. Because increasingly, when at the start of my career, some 30, 40 years ago, I always had to talk about the future and about future goals and objectives, winning elections, trying to beat uh, competitors and trying to make your point, I now increasingly receive invitations to look back on the past. And so 2008 seems like yesterday, but in fact 2024 and uh, people change, not the least the uh, human beings. And so I very, feel very privileged to be here standing in front of you. And driving to Brussels uh, this morning, I was trying to imagine in what kind of atmosphere um, the renewal extension of the Benelux was, was discussed and decided. And to be honest, I think, and the colleagues can contradict me, but that indeed 2008, that period of time, was from an international point of view also seen from a mid-sized country like Belgium or seen from the Benelux, when we were looking at the global stage, the atmosphere, the tendencies, the dynamics, the basic dynamics of development, economic development, geopolitical development, were completely different. And there, of course, I'm in danger to have the negativity bias and to say, well, it was better before. But it is right that in terms of some major issues, we were living in the kind of golden ages with still the kind of feeling that representative democracy would overcome all challenges and would be spread all over the globe in all nations step by step together with freeing the economy. We were, I think 2008 was the year of the Olympic Games in Beijing. We were living the golden age of the China, EU, China, US relations with Hu Jintao leading China and with peacemaking, peace-loving and opening and, and trade and engagement of China re-entering the world's history. Times have changed since then. And that brings me to my second point, apart from saying that I feel privileged to stand here in front of you. It is that certainly in this period of time, like today, international cooperation is of course needed, I would say even more, there's no alternative. And I think the extent to which we will manage in the course of the next decades, our successors will manage to cope with the very important challenges we are facing are really depending on the deepening and of the strength of international corporations. Corporations plural because our multilateral system not only Belgium is multilateral, but also our multilateral system has different sizes of cooperation, different geographies, different constituencies. And the bigger ones are, I think, today more in trouble than the what smaller ones. But the other way around, I think that more restricted, more limited corporations can be the engine of reboosting multilateral cooperation. And so, at the end of this month, in New York, there will be a, a debate and we will try to have resolutions or the UN will try to decide on the summit for the future and on resolutions that try to describe how to address from a multilateral cooperation point the future and the challenges of the future. Well, in 2008, when we decided to renew, to extend the treaty, and that was not just a discussion that took a couple of seconds, no, there was really debate and, and things were, were thought over. One of the reasons was that the Benelux had a proven track record of not only being a level of cooperation between the three nations, two kingdoms and a grand duchy, but also a kind of institution, light institution that could, could form a kind of engine for broader cooperation in broader uh, structures. And so today I think the Benelux is needed as such, but it also has a very important role to play as a kind of engine for strengthening the multilateral cooperation in other 
domains and in other uh, treaties and in other corporations, including the European Union. European Union, where the three of our countries, three of the six founding fathers of the European communities, currently the European Union, that is also at the crossroads about this geopolitical role, about uh, addressing the challenges like the climate change, like uh, organizing mobility within, within the Union, and so on and so on, enlarging also the scope of its cooperation to domains like health policy and, and like security, migration. Well, in this kind of setting up the future, a good future, manage to have a good future for the European Union, I think that the Benelux has a role to play that cannot be underestimated. When I think about 2008 and the discussions then, there was a reason that was very close to my heart um, to advocate for that extension and to defend it in the Parliament and in other meetings where we had, of course, to uh, be accountable for the decisions we took. It is that in 2008, when we extended the lifetime of the Benelux, we added also for the first time, very explicitly, the fact that the cooperation was not only about working together and deepening the working together between Luxembourg, Belgium and, and, and the Netherlands, but that we also would make possible via specific structures and, and institutional setups, a closer cooperation with the surrounding regions. When we look from very far to Europe, I think it's right to say that the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, but a little bit broader than that, the northern part of France, even until northern Italy, including North Rhine-Westfalen, Baden-Württemberg, is really a unique power station of the world's economy. And so the fact that the treaty then, the new treaty, made it possible to include that kind of cooperations was for me another very important reason. And since a trustworthy uh, assessment of performance, a kind of SWOT analysis, also comprises weaknesses, I would say, and this is Chatham rules, I hope, but uh, well, if it's not Chatham rules, I'm a free person, I just say it in front of you, that there in terms of delivery, the Benelux should invest more energy, the political leaders should invest more energy in seizing the opportunity of deepening the cooperation, starting from the Benelux with the surrounding regions. Quite successful today and very concrete in terms of North Rhine-Westfalen, where then our common friend Jürgen Rutgers was the minister president. Since then, I think you've done a good job, Mr. Wakers. But yesterday I had dinner with a former mayor of a West Flanders city and she was complaining about the criminality in her city and the fact that still today in 2024, when there is an act of criminality at that side of the lay at the Lys, some people know where, what I'm talking about, that it's still not possible to go after criminals the moment you cross the border. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but in fact, that's still the case today in Europe without borders, national borders, and in periods of free mobility. So I would encourage really the leadership, the political leadership and the leadership of the Benelux to show added value by deepening, by being an engine of deepening the cooperation, not only in the easy fields, but also in the very politically sensitive areas, sovereignty related areas, where ordinary citizens on a daily basis don't understand anymore 2024 in these present times that it is still possible that a so-called non-existing border makes it impossible to efficiently tackle criminality because there's an uh, insufficient degree of cooperation. And so that brings me to the last uh, remark I wanted to make in full honesty and transparency. I'm still proud that I was amongst the three people that uh, together with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs amongst, which, uh, amongst whom was Jean Asselborn, I'm still proud of that, but I think it is important today, and I want to seize the opportunity also of the presence of uh, people representing the younger generations, to know that treaties, institutions, they are very important. Actually, they survive human beings, 80 years. Um, 80 years, and you're ready for the next 20, 50 years. But when it comes to delivering added value, it is about people. It is about people that make the difference, 
the political representatives, the uh, civil servants, small team Benelux, but still very valuable people. And I think that altogether the political leadership, but also the staff have the task in the coming couple of decades in some very precise domains to showcase, to display a level of activity and cooperation that can in 20 years lead to a session like this where all people can be proud that Benelux has delivered. Let me give two, three examples. In the Benelux Corporation, you have a very powerful Dutch presence, you have a Belgian active presence, and you have the uh, very important activity of Luxembourg and the friendship and the cooperation between these nations. I'm, however, not always sure that these three member states of the European Union realize themselves that although we have had a deepening of the cooperation at the level of the European Union, but that there is still a long way to go in different domains to have a real European policy, European sovereignty even in some domains. Professionally, I'm working a lot outside of Europe. To give you one example, I can tell you that the competition to design, produce, and be present in the markets of the microchips, for instance. We have fantastic tools in the Benelux. We have ISML, and I hope that the abbreviation is the right one, because sometimes I mix up the letters. In the Netherlands, we have IMEC, and we have the European Chips Act. But the European Chips Act is, in fact, national money that, so to say, is brought together, is not real union money. And the reality today is when I see what's happening outside of the European Union, what I see is competition. Competition between EU member states with deep pockets and EU member states with not so deep pockets. Well, I'm sure that trying to be real allies, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, that it is a nice example of where we can make a difference to invest sufficiently in research and development in that domain and in others is not so easy for a country like Belgium separately, even less easy than for the Netherlands. And for, the Luxembourg, for Luxembourg must be the same. But in joining forces, we have a GDP that is bigger than the Spanish one. And if we have more resources than some very important member states of the European Union, why would it be impossible if I look at the three objectives of the Benelux Corporation that at a certain moment somebody stands up political leader says, well, instead of competing against each other and seeing that the nicest economic projects sometimes go to Dunkirk or go to Germany instead of being established in a Benelux country because of subsidies, because of the bigger pockets, the deeper pockets of some bigger and mid-sized member states, why couldn't we counter this with a deepening cooperation? It is only one example. I could go to the... Uh, uh, for instance, another challenge, the energy policy, the issues that are there to be debated in the course of the next decades, the failure, the, 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 the possibly dangerously failure of Europe to achieve its goals in terms of CO2 emission re reduction, renewables, production of renewable energy, and so on. I think these are examples that can be better addressed in working together. To conclude, because I see you nodding impatiently, uh, <laughs> And I forgive you this grand dishy uh, <laughs> affair. But um, I think that when we are gathered here today in Brussels, we are aware of what the Benelux means. I mean, we as uh, officials, as diplomats, as political people, and as uh, former leaders. Outside, in the three countries, it's a little bit less. And there's some there's headroom to improve uh, the, the consciousness of people of what the Benelux is. But it is more than ever also the task to strengthen the cooperation to address the real issues of the future within the European Union, but with a stronger voice if we are united. And that's all I wish is that in the coming decades, and I don't know if I will be here sitting in the room, but that when we go from 80 to 100, we can say, well, in some domains, as a Benelux, we have taken the initiative and we really have made a difference as formally competing mid-size and smaller nations. Thank you very much.
And it was already said that a treaty was signed in The Hague, so of course you could not, not be there. You were very much present. You welcomed everybody eh, for that treaty. Jan Peter Balgen and the Dutch Prime Minister at the time, still a uh, visiting professor at the Erasmus University uh, in Rotterdam. And I think we're all wondering what your views are because uh, Mr. Letema was already very clear on what he thinks the union should be and should do more. We're very uh, honored to hear you out. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear uh, Yves, dear Jean, students, dear friends. I did not intend to correct the moderator. I intend to congratulate Luxembourg with being a kingdom. <laughs> Fantastic, it's a great day. And it reminds me of something that happened to me when I was prime minister. Our queen, mm -hmm. Queen Beatrix, was 25 years in office and there was an exhibition in a, bu in a beautiful church in The Hague. And they invited me as prime minister to give a speech. And it was announced twice as president. <laughs> you're a prime minister of the kingdom and you're announced as a president. That was really the grandmistress of, grandmaster of the queen said, oh my God, this is humor, this is nice. Um, 80 years, Benelux, congratulations. Uh, rich history, a long time. So this is a time to reflect on what happened, what has been achieved, but also to have a view on the future. And I intend to make three remarks. One, inspiration. Two, some key elements and personal experiences, and three, the way forward. Do you agree with these three points? Can we do it? Yes? He said, no, okay, then we'll do it that way. This was the moment of interaction in my speech. <laughs> um, first, inspiration. Uh, you mentioned the fact that after my time as Prime Minister, I became again a professor, but I'm also active in the business sector. I became part of the corporate responsibility at EY and so young. And that means that constantly I'm busy with issues around sustainability, corporate responsibility. And not so long ago, I was invited to give a speech for a fantastic Dutch company. And they had a really good strategy regarding sustainability. And I asked them, what is, in fact, the wording, the title of your strategy? And then they said, we talk in terms of serve to win. That's beautiful. Serve to win. You're not starting with winning, but serving society, doing good for society, having sustainable business practices, it's always about serving. And I think that it also counts for the Benelux. It's about serving people and their interests. Serving is key. It's also value relevant for the EU. And then I also must think about uh, Herman van Rompuy. He said, Europe should be the Europe of results. So it's a matter of serving and reaching results. Another source of inspiration. I'm a big defender and supporter of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. I think it's a fantastic set of goals. It's about quality of life for everyone. The basic idea is leave no one behind. And goal number 17 is called Partnerships for the Goals. And I remember very well when Ban Ki-moon, and we'll meet him next week in, in, in Korea, Ban Ki-moon, he was the Secretary General, and he said we will never reach SDGs without the private sector. And therefore, partnerships are key. You never can reach things on your own. You need each other. Therefore, partnerships are key. And it also counts for the Benelux. It's a kind of partnerships. Now, we're all young. I can imagine you like reading books. <laughs> you just, and what have you read? We don't have the time for that. But one of my favorite books is Why Nations Fail. Have you heard about the book? It's, in fact, a fantastic book. The result of 15 years of research, 3,000 year old history. And the question is, when? Can countries be successful and why not? What are the conditions? And the answer of these two researches, as Smoker Robinson, is very clear. One, you must be innovative. If you're not innovating, you will lose in the long run. Two, you must have the rule of law because it has no use to be profitable and that then that's corruption or bad legal system. And the third one is you must have inclusive institutions. People must be able to share in the revenues of economic well-being. You need institutions. And also the Benelux is an institution. So therefore, serve partnerships and institutions are really key when we talk about an institute like the Benelux. That brings me to my second point. If you are considering the history of the Benelux, there are three important years. 1944, during the Second World War. Political leaders said, let's think about our future, even in the time of the war. It was a very important step, the sign that you want to work together. The next step, 1958. The Benelux Treaty, and then we talked about the Benelux Economic Union, and it was successful. And then in 2008, the renewed Benelux Treaty, and then we talk about the Benelux Union. And in fact, there are two important goals. It's about being a front runner in Europe by working together, 
And at the same moment, it's a matter of finding solutions for issues for the people that are living in neighboring countries. And then the focus was on uh, internal market and economic union. It's about uh, sustainability and security. These are the key issues. You can talk in terms of the structure. And that is when we talk about treaty and uh, the, the meetings and so on. It's also a matter of culture. That's a people uh, element. And that brings me to some uh, experience I had. Jean-Claude Juncker mentioned that. Every time we had a, a European Council meeting, we had a meeting, a breakfast meeting with the Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Benelux. It was a matter of inform each other and how can you support each other if possible. I think it was very useful to have these type of meetings, knowing what you think about uh, those elements. Eva, I remember the day when we had the terrible financial crisis, 2008. And we were here in Brussels to talk about the future of the Fortress Bank. And we tried to find a solution via the market that was not possible, so then it was also the responsibility of the governments and the prime ministers to find a solution. We were here, also a moment of the willingness to work together to find a solution, because it could have led to collapse of the financial system. That was what's on at stake, that was the really important thing. Also, it's important that you can talk with each other in an informal way. Uh, I remember we had the referendum on the European Constitution that led to a no in the Netherlands. It was a difficult moment. And of course, Jean-Claude Juncker phoned me just to express his discontent about the outcome. I agreed with him, that was true. But you must have this moment to talk with each other. And I think it's important to have these informal meetings. Um, the, 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 the combination of so, and the, 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 the working together, cooperation with Northern Westphalia. Uh, Jean-Claude, uh, even I, we received uh, North Rhine-Westfalen Staatspreis. Well, that was, uh, was nice. But in fact, it was the expression of the government of Northern Westphalia just to work together with Benelux. Beautiful. And it's also a nice custom, and Frans, you know it, uh, when there's a new prime minister, in any case in the Netherlands, you do not go to, uh, to Paris or Berlin or at least to London. No, first you go to the Benelux partners. First you go to your colleagues in Brussels and, and in Luxembourg. I think that's good. That says something about the willingness to cooperate. And it brings me to my, 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 my third point, uh, the way forward. I agree with the items um, Eve has already said. Uh, if you talk about a sustainable future, we need each other. If you talk about security, we need each other. Migration is everything. But I would like to underline today two or three elements. The first is, and I see young people here, listen to the young generation. That's exactly the reason when I stopped as prime minister, I said, in any case, I want to go back to university. I was, prime minister, I was a professor before I became prime minister. It's good to talk with young people. I like the meeting of young professionals of companies. My recommendation to CEOs is to always talk with young professionals because they're new ideas. So that's also my recommendation for the balance, talk with young people. Therefore, I'm so uh, grateful that you're here. The second point, um, when we talk about our future, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, there are a lot of risks for Europe. Sometimes you get the impression that Europe is a kind of battlefield between China, a superpower, or the United States, sanctions from both sides. We have to rethink our own position. That's my conviction. And if not, you can have difficulties. If you would speak with Jose Manuel Barroso, for example, he's concerned about, let's say, innovation in this part of the world. Uh, it's good that we have now reports of Letta and Draghi and others. How can we strengthen our position? It's really necessary. And, and therefore, um, a colleague of mine, Gerhard uh, van Buys, a professor of Free University, and I, we have written a book with the title Capitalism Reconnected Toward a Sustainable Inclusion of the Market Economy in Europe. And we say we must reposition Europe, but also on the base of our own ideals, because we have an, our own view on the economy, the Rhineland tradition, the social market economy. It's also about the right balance between economic, social and economic developments, ecological developments. It's uh, about uh, the taking care for all stakeholders, not only the shareholders. We have our own model in Europe, and we have to rethink our position, and economically and geopolitically. I think this is key. And in our book, we say you need a multi-actor approach. And I think this is also relevant for Benelux. It's not only governments, no, you need, in fact, and universities and businesses and NGOs because they are all part of the arena and that is so necessary. Therefore, I would like to underline the fact we need a multi-actor approach. And my third element, when I was Prime Minister, and did you know that I always talked about the essence of values and norms in society. And I believe it's so important to talk about what are the values that drive us. And when we had the presidency of European Council and European Union in the second part of 2004, we had a whole series of conferences around the question, what holds us together? Why are we Europeans? Europe, a beautiful idea. And I th I'm glad that we did, we've taken up that, uh, that initiative. 
it's always important to talk about what drives you. If you talk about SDGs, the key element is leave no one behind. And after the Second World War, people said this should never happen again. We should improve quality of lives for everyone. And when we talk about the future of Benelux, it's also about the why question. And I see in among businesses, more and more it's about what's your DNA, what are your values, well, what, what is the, the, the reason for doing your activities. And I think this is also key for the Benelux. It's much more than only technique or a structure. It's a matter of feeling responsible for the future for the people. And that has to do with, with values. So I would like to underline the word of values. The risk for politicians is that the microphone they never stop. Uh, I should stop now. Uh, and I'm not a politician any longer, so there's no reason to be there. And you also talked about humor. Yeah, I I didn't mean, know maybe you were last so one. Funny. Maybe last one because it's also, it's also serious. I remember the time that was not the prime minister of, of Belgium, the eerste minister. There was the prime minister of Flanders, Bert Somers, and he, we had a meeting. I was just prime minister. He was prime minister of Flanders, and then he said, "I have a dinner with Mr. Balkan, and I will take my bread with me." <laughs> and luckily, the Dutch uh, diplomats uh, they discovered that he had said it, and then we had the dinner. Uh, in uh, my department in, uh, in, in The Hague. And then I said to the catering, when we have the starter, give everyone the starter. You give me as the last one, the, the, the man who's sitting uh, in the opposite uh, room, don't give anything to him. <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, oh, welcome, uh, Prime Minister Zomer, welcome the, the, the delegation from Flans. It's good to be here that you can talk about the points of common interest. And uh, Mr. Prime Minister, understood you've taken your bread with you, so I give you the opportunity to. <laughs> Ah, and then the answer was, of course, oh, have you been with me, you know, man? <laughs> and then I said, yes, we've taken care for your bread. And then he received three slices of bread. <laughs> That's also a solution. And after he received his starter. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't know you were so funny. <laughs> Before we start our conversation uh, with all of you, um, I, at least one person still has to take the floor, and we already mentioned in Jean Asselborn, because uh, Mr. Juncker could not be here, but you were also present at the time when the decision-making progress uh, was being taken place, and the question was asked, what should we do? Because you were then a vice prime minister and minister of foreign affairs, and there was the upgrade today uh, to the kingdom of Luxembourg. So you can have the final word, Jean Asselborn. So um, I was never prime minister, and uh, English is not my manga tongue, so I need some uh, help from this uh, paper. But uh, starting with uh, our name, uh, maybe you remember, dear colleagues, that in uh, the Vienna Congress in uh, 1815, we came out as a uh, duchy. And uh, a little bit later, we became a grand duchy. The problem was that we became smaller, <laughs> but the name, the name wrong. So, and I would say, uh, I would propose that if uh, we could be a kingdom, then it must be a grand kingdom, <laughs> to make a little bit of difference with both of you. So uh, I will make this proposition tomorrow in Luxembourg, and maybe in one year you will, I will invite you to come to Luxembourg, and then we will officially do this. Now, on uh, what I should tell you a little bit. Uh, first, a lot of things have been said, but I think also, as uh, my, two of my colleagues said, that it is a, a very, very strong particularity of Pendelox that the idea was, uh, came out uh, in, in London. We had been in war, and uh, this was September 19. 44, remember what happened later, the war was not over. Uh, if he, I tell you the name Bastogne, Bardasson, uh, the Battle of the Balch uh, started uh, 16th of December uh, 1944 and ended only at the end of January. And I just um, saw the, the figures and I will tell you uh, 75,000 US soldiers lost their life, 63,000 German soldiers, 1,400 from, uh, from UK, and also 3,000 civilians lost their life after this signature when everybody 
expect it's the end of the war, but the war continued uh, with this Rundstadt Offensive, as we say, as the Germans say. It, but it, it, it really was a strong, a very strong signal that um, after this war, everything should be done, every cooperation should be established to make better life of the people after the war. The second date, 1958, uh, yes, uh, it was the first uh, uh, Benelux Treaty, 58. Uh, just today I have to mention it. It's the birthday of the Fifth Republic in France. And finally, after more than 50 days, France has a new prime minister. His name is Barnier, a very well-known person in the European uh, Union. And we wish France good luck. Because uh, France without uh, a government is very, very difficult for the European Union to function uh, in such a case. But uh, 58, and I just wanted to, uh, to look to my friend uh, Jan Peter, is also a very important date for both of our countries. Maybe that you do no more remember, but in 58, Charlie Gaulle won the Tour de France. And he won the Tour de France in a team that was uh, a Neil Lux team, Netherlands, Luxembourg. Maybe that you remember Wim van Est and Piep van Est, very famous uh, cyclists in, in the Netherlands, but above all, uh, Charlie Gaulle, who was uh, the winner of the Tour de France and a hero uh, in our country. So now to the serious things. Uh, I think that um, over the past uh, 80 years, our three countries built a strong uh, foundation of cooperation, benefiting citizens, and serving as a model for European integration. And that is very, very important. If we took a, a decision, if we made a proposition as foreign ministers also in, in the EU, when we said this is a Benelux proposition, that was more than a proposition of three countries of the European Union. And I think uh, here we have a responsibility to uh, that also in the future that must be possible. Uh, the signature of the new treaty on the 17th of June in 2008 in The Hague, and I remember this very well, was um, a significant moment during my, my several mandates, but uh, witnessing the fruits uh, that the Benelux Corporation bears, it was uh, uh, for me always a very remarkable gesture. It was not so easy eh, this time. Uh, we had discussions. Uh, should we change some things or should we continue? But at the end of the day, I think our three countries took the right decision uh, to do what we have done. So I know that um, I am the last one and I will be very, very uh, short. But I wanted to, to say at the end one thing as a politician uh, concerning Benelux and uh, comparing to what we see now in a lot of countries of the European Union and also we have to be aware that, and Jan Peter said it, we three countries, we are the founding members of the European Union. Founding members of the European Union. <laughs> so my expectation is that Benelux, uh, that means the three governments of the three Benelux countries and also the Benelux national parliaments, the three countries, Luxembourg, in the uh, Netherlands and in, in Belgium, that they remain really in the cockpit, if I uh, can say, of a strong and of an integrated European Union. Being aware of its responsibility for the young generations. We have young people between us and also they, above all they, they have to write to have a guarantee that they can live the next eight years in peace and in freedom. So, in the Benelux, to prevent our identity, we have to promote the defense of rule of law and uh, also the humanitarian dimension in foreign affairs. 
especially concerning the protection of minorities, of refugees, and finally, by preventing and combating extremism, populism, discrimination, and hate in our countries. I think it was um, Yves who said that we have young people with us here. Yes, and we have to listen to these young people. Maybe that these young people have also to understand that people of our age, I am 75, and I was 20 years foreign minister in, in the European Union, in a country of the European Union, that pay attention when you have your piece of paper where you can choose democratically a party. I heard that in Germany, now in the two countries, in, uh, in um, Thuringen and also in Sachsen, more than 30% of the first voters voted for AfD. You know what AfD is? AfD is a party that wants to destroy the values of the European Union. And we have to be very, very clear to say to the young people, Schengen, you want also in the future travel in 27 countries and more without being stopped on the borders. You, young people, want to profit of what we call Erasmus. Erasmus is not an invention of AfD. It is an invention of the European Union. And without Erasmus, I think it would be very, very easier to study not only the European Union, even above the European Union. Therefore, uh, dear friends here in this room, I think that um, we do not have, as politicians, to reduce the fight against extremism with a fight against migration. Without, without migration, I think that we also here in Benelux, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and in Luxembourg, Luxembourg has 48% non-Luxembourgish people, we would not have, as you said, the same GDP than Spain. So let's be clear, we have concerning migration do everything we can do and we should do more for our security, but don't think that we will solve the problems of this time by listening to those who want to say that everything has to be done, that migration would disappear. To end, I want to tell you that as foreign minister, uh, I was <coughs> with, uh, foreign, with the different uh, ministers I, I was always the same because I had been there uh, a long time, but uh, with uh, Timmermans, France, uh, with um, also, uh, I don't remember all the, but uh, Bert Kunders, uh, with uh, Didier Reinders, uh, with um, Ben, no, not Ben, but uh, with Steph, <laughs> Steph Block, and, and so on. So I stop here. But we had been three times in Ukraine, three times. The first time, 2013, immediately after what happened on the Maidan place. We had been later two times more in Ukraine and we wanted to really to, to tell Poroshenko in the beginning and then also uh, the new uh, uh, President uh, Zelensky that European Union is on your side to help you. We had been in Iraq, we had been in Jordan, we had been last year in Ghana and we have been in Kenya to tell the African Union, the African politician, that this war, Russian war against Ukraine, is not a European war, but it is a war against democracy and also against the rules of the Charter of the United Nations. Thank you very much. And now it's done listening. I think we've listened quite a lot, especially the young people that were
told we want to listen to you, but I think it's time now to listen to the next gen. But of course, everybody else in the room is also very welcome to ask a question and to have a small conversation. It's already five o'clock, so I have to watch a little bit my clock for the timing. But we have two microphones here. I think uh, Mr. Uh, Asselhorn has a microphone and Mr. Balkan and, the, and there's one to go into the room. And maybe one of you of the European Youth Parliament, because you're all here, wants already to ask a question. Let's do it like this. You say who you are, who you represent, and you ask your question, and then you say to whom you want to ask your question, so that not all the three of the gentlemen have to reply, because then I don't think we'll be here. Well, we'll still be here by morning, I think, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. But still, there's another part of the evening that still has to unfold. So maybe you could give you the microphone, yes? That would be nice. <laughs> and from then on, Victoria will take Thank over. You so Thank much. you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us as European Youth Parliament. We're here from EYP Belgium, EYP Luxembourg, and EYP the Netherlands. We're very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Isina Sandemir. I'm representing the European Youth Parliament of the Netherlands today. I wanted to, first of all, once again, thank you for inviting us as a youth organization. We know this is quite a prestigious place for us to be here, and we're very proud and very honored. Um, my question is also regarding youth participation. Um, we know that there's a lot of youth organizations in Europe, and they tend to try to go abroad on international level. But I wanted to ask, how would you, specifically Jan, pa Jan Peter Balkenende, envision further youth participation and further youth um, encouragement and exchange of cross cultures among the Benelux specifically? Thank you. Excellent question. Um, first, in general remark. Uh, some months ago, I read the article in the Dutch Financial Daily, Financial Dagblad. And it was about young people in different European countries, and they want to invest in new ways the democracy should function. And they are organizing events, uh, debates, and it was very stimulating to read what those guys intended to do. It was not about their own career, no, it was about the quality of democracy, the involvement of youth can be, uh, can be strengthened. There are instruments. I think we need another type of debate. Uh, and my concern about politics is so much short-termism. It's about what's in the news today. And we need a long-term character, long-term orientation, otherwise you get difficulties. And you will be the victims because you're young. So it is therefore essential that you listen to the views of young people. How do you consider the future? What is, do you see as possibilities? I think this is key. There are some instruments for that. You can organize debates in the right way to make it attractive, but also take young people seriously. Let me give an example from the business sector. I've seen some companies in the Netherlands, they invite young people to come up with new ideas. And then the board of a company says, we will take it over, and if not, then we will explain why it's not possible. Then you take young people seriously. That's one. The second point is, it's important that young people talk with each other. I enjoyed a meeting with young boards of the construction companies in the Netherlands. Different companies are working together. The same counts for the audit firms. So if you have so many possibilities to come together and to say, this is on our mind. So therefore, I think we must have another type of debate, uh, more long-term focus, honesty in the discussions, talking about the consequences of, let's say, short-termism, uh, if it's going too far. And, and therefore, I think we, we I couldn't agree more with you. you. We have to find new ways to involve uh, young people, not only to say we talk of young people, no, take them seriously, take them the proposal seriously, and to try to find instruments that make that possible. Yeah, Peter, just one sec, one sentence. Uh, you know that this time, for the European elections. In five European countries, it was possible to vote with 16 years. So this next time must be in 27 countries. Because I think if young people are really interested and if they have the responsibility uh, with, uh, how do you say, Stimmzettel, Bulletin de Vote, with a the ballot, no, how do you say, uh, then I think you are more interested and you are more uh, yeah, you, you feel your responsibility and we have to give this to the young generation and starting with 16 years, I think that's a good idea for all the countries if we have the next European elections. Thank you for the answers, thank you for the question. Who wants to ask the next question? It's at the back. Yes, you can go in front. Yeah, it's a bit... 
small space, but we'll manage. Good afternoon, who are you? Thank you for the floor. My name is Joris Dietz. I'm also a representative of UAP the Netherlands. Um, and in April, we are organizing a conference exactly about the topic that Mr. Balkan had just addressed, strengthening democracy, talking about solutions for security and peace um, with young people from all over our continent. Now, my question is addressed to Mrs. Le uh, Mr. Leterme around the topic of security, as this is one of the key pillars of the Benelux Union as well. If the Benelux Union is, is really this proof town, this innovation lab, um, we must stimulate innovation on in all these aspects, including security. And for some time now in Europe, many people, among others youth, are talking about a joint European army. And I was wondering how you would feel about real big steps in uniting our armed forces and strengthening the security of our union. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for uh, your question. You, you touch a, a one of the crucial uh, let's say, stepping stones for a sustainable future for European Union and our societies, and also to keep up our way of living. I think there's a, well, I think, I mean, it's uh, just a fact. The rising antagonism between uh, uh, the US and China puts pressure on the security policies of the member states of the European Union and puts them in front of their responsibilities. Um, I think it's fair to say that over the last 30, 40 years, we're uh, outsourced of security needs and our defense needs to the uh, US, to the United States, uh, even within the North Atlantic Alliance. And the United States have been very good at protecting us and, and building further on the history of the 20th century, where they came twice to save us. They have done it again when we were in trouble to uh, fix issues in the Balkans, when we were kind of divided to address some other security issues. I think this could well be kind of changing now. Uh, this, I think this time is kind of coming to an end. Um, we have war on the European continent now. I come from a place where the most important landmark monument is this never again about the First World War. Reality is that we have again a war on the European continent at uh, three hours flight from here. So we don't need another illustration, I think, of the fact that we have to um, act um, in accordance to, to the needs, and this means investing more in our capacity to defend our vital interests, if and uh, invest sufficiently in, in all kinds of aspects of that kind of policy. This means with budgetary impact. I would only add one thing. It is that we should also have the courage to take an own position and to not just align with those people sometimes because they defend vested economic interests that go for a race uh, to, the, to the top in terms of armament. Um, the geopolitical scene is rebalancing. Uh, China has re-entered world's history. Um, some other BRICS or some other uh, new nations are waking up and see things differently than we see things. We have to learn, uh, draw lessons from that. I think it, uh, it won't be anymore like in the 20th century that we can educate the rest of the world and tell them how to behave. We have to take into account different opinions. And so based on a good philosophy that takes into account this need to counter the antagonism, the need to uh, take into account different visions, uh, points of views and way of structuring democracy, structuring governance, structuring a way of life that are different to ours, I think we have to develop a philosophy and acting along this, uh, this uh, philosophy and strategy and put the money on the table, put the, uh, the, uh, the instruments in place that make it possible to have an own position as the European Union and as the European continent to defend ourselves and our vital interests, but in a non-aggressive way towards other parts of the globe. Okay, thank you. Next question, maybe somebody from uh, another country? <laughs> Um, hello. hello, my name is Amira Eldashava and I'm representing EYP Belgium here today. It's a very big honor to be able to speak with you today. And my question is, so because like creating a European army 
you know, it's not in process yet and there are a lot of opinions about it. So, for instance, there is a Flemish party, New Flemish Alliance, which is fond of the idea of creating a, a joint Benelux army. Do you think that that could be a possible solution to that problem? And do you think that it's a good point or not? And why? Thank you. Um, yeah, I would. <laughs> small, it's small the strongest, the strongest military. Uh, yeah, you force. can take the question. Yeah, whoever okay. wants to answer the question. One of the men. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you want to take the okay, question. I, yes. Uh, so, I don't think that we had huge debates in the European Union, and you can remember as long as UK was member of the European Union, it was not possible. Then after this, uh, after they left the European Union in 2020, uh, it was a little bit easier to, to, to make a better cooperation possible between the European armies. Uh, so I'm sorry, but I think it's, it's not um, appropriate to speak about the Benelux army. Uh, if we speak about a European army, I agree with you, but I think that we do not need a European army. What we need is a good synergy, a good cooperation between the existing armies in the European Union. You know that uh, at a certain moment, I think it was in, 40 f in 54, 55, when in, uh, when in France they said, no, we do not want uh, a defense cooperation in Europe. Uh, that was in France, that, uh, in the, that was not in the, in the Fifth Republic, it was in the Fourth Republic, that they said no, and till this moment, you know that France had also a little bit problems to have a total 100% cooperation in NATO. Uh, uh, always, uh, so I think, to answer your question, we have to continue to make more cooperation between the European armies. If we if you take our three countries, Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Dutch, they have a very good cooperation already. We, as Luxembourg, are, so we, we have no planes, we have no, no ships, but uh, we have our army is uh, 1,000 uh, soldiers. But we have the, the will not only to cooperate with money, but also to cooperate in, in the field. We had been together, and I saw these people, for instance, in Afghanistan uh, with. Uh, Dutch uh, and with the German uh, uh, army. Uh, we have done a lot, I think, also with the Belgium army together. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, uh, assistance. Uh, so, this is the way we should do it. You are from Germany, if I, and, no, you are from Belgium. Uh, but in Germany, uh, you know, we have a huge discussion about uh, the vendor, uh, everything that concerns this. 100 billion euros have been invested after uh, the beginning of the war uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And so uh, you are right, If I think we cannot only expect that also in the next 50 years only the Americans will guarantee our, our security. That, that's clear. And uh, what happened in 22 changed a lot. So. Uh, I stop here, but a better cooperation between the European existing armies that doesn't take a lot of time and can be efficient. Just uh, 10 That's seconds of intermezzo be okay. between Jean Asselborn and Jan Peter Balken, and we, we're in the midst of, of the Benelux. Just to add, especially to, towards you as a representative of younger generations, this is typically a domain where efforts have to be, uh, well, put forward and have to be produced over the next couple of decades. But this is really long-term efforts. And the second is, it is not popular. So I would say there's no low-hanging fruit. This will need a lot of taxpayers' money. It's not always popular to come up for uh, more uh, resources for defense policy. And it's important that the kind of discussion about, uh, well, if we uh, try to construct, to put in place a stronger capacity to defend ourselves, it's also important that that debate is not left over to politicians or military people. This should be really a debate that is owned by the population, where there is an open and frank conversation about what kind of interests we want to defend, what is it we build up our defense capacity, and this should be a debate with 
as many people as possible. So I encourage you, uh, through your question, to continue your interest in that domain and to continue the debate, not even leaving it over to only the male part of the population. Um, in early days, there was a fantastic British television series, Yes Minister or Yes Prime Minister. It was about humor. It was about the relationship between ministers and civil servants. And one of the wordings was of the civil servants, you're on your own now, Prime Minister. And that means that the civil servant doesn't have control about the, the Prime Minister. It's so funny. Once I was in the Wilkin Forum in Davos, then I, I had that the meeting only with Prime Ministers, without the civil servants, that you're on your own now. I use the wording, you're on your own now. This is also a bit the wording for Europe. We are on our own. Because we do not know what will happen in the United States after the elections in November. We are listening to what Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump is saying. So you do not know what really is happening. So we have to uh, be aware of the fact that the world is changing and we are more on our own now. And that means we have to, and you've made good remarks about that, we have to think about the quality of our yeah. armies and so on. When I was Prime Minister, I asked how many people really can be used for international missions with rather low. We spend a lot of money, but not in the right way. So we have to do things in a much better way. And I would like to uh, uh, broaden this discussion a bit because uh, in the time of Corona, we, we thought we are so dependent on resources from China, products from China, and we've seen the risks. So that led also to discussion about strategic autonomy. So we have to rethink our own position, and I think the Benelux can play a part in this, an important part in this discussion. So therefore, we need this type of questions. I think it's time for a final question, maybe someone from Luxembourg from the Kingdom of Luxembourg. Oh. <laughs> Una principessa. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Anna Perlig and I represent the European Youth Parliament Luxembourg. Uh, so my question concerns the sustainability pillar of the Benelux Union. And I was wondering how, do, how does the Benelux Union approach climate policies and how do they fit into the wider framework of European climate policies? Can they complement these existing policies or is it a matter where you go into more depth because you have smaller countries that can maybe forge different areas of cooperation? Thank you. Who do you want to address it to? Um, Who can have the final answer? The last word? <laughs> Who feels most... <laughs> ah, then it must be Luxembourg. <laughs> so, Asselborn? <Asubon? laughs> I, I will give the answer, and you have to say, yeah, okay. I, I, just, I fully agree, that that's, <laughs> that's how it works. That uh, was what you were going to do the whole yeah, time, but you, I, I you're failed, not. I failed, I failed, I <laughs> failed. Now, the, uh, your, your uh, remark is, is, is important about what's our position. And I must say, I'm a bit concerned. We have the Green Deal in Europe. We see anti-ESG force in the United States. That's what you can see. And we have to speed up developments, because if we talk about climate issues, unpredictability is in nature. Natural resources, it's all there. And sometimes people are talking in a kind of defensive way about sustainability, but you can also think in another way, in a much more offensive way, and considering sustainability as an opportunity. And that's also the message of our book, Capitalism Reconnected. We say we should have a combination of entrepreneurship and doing good for society. And if not, others will take over. I was invited a few times in Japan to take part in an online discussion about the circular economy. That had to do with ethical reasons, but also business reasons. So those companies that are really willing to renew their strategies, that will be the ones in the longer run. And I really hope that Europe can take up that position. But therefore, we must work together. We need uh, new ideas. Uh, we have to speed up developments. And if not, others will take over. We've seen the electric uh, vehicles. We have a fantastic car industry in Germany. But we are too late. You've seen what was in China is happening. And we can give many of these uh, examples. So I think we still have room to do things in the right way, but we have to act and we have to speed up developments. And if not, we will be the loser in the long run. That cannot be the case. So therefore, I would like to underline what you've said. We need a kind of offensive approach when we talk about sustainability and the future of Europe. I agree, I agree. Okay. I 50% agree. <laughs> no, I just wanted to add a couple of sentences to say that for me, sustainability is much more than environmental sustainability. And so, especially thinking about the future of the Benelux and as an engine of cooperation within the European Union, 
What makes us different to other places in the globe is also the social welfare states. And so one of the bigger issues, can we keep in place that inclusive societies that have been built up since the Second World War more specifically and where the ideas in London in 44 and then afterwards when drafting the European treaties were at the center, the social welfare state. So sustainability is also about inclusion and is far beyond just the environmental uh, objectives. Okay, thank you very much. I learned serve to win and politicians stay politicians, which is a good thing. No, actually, this is a good thing. Um, with these uh, final remarks, I would like to thank you all for joining us here this afternoon. Now it's time to all go to the Grand Hall and smile and shine because there's a photo opportunity with all of us. So please join us there. Thank you very much. <laughs>